what an incredible player, first and foremost. I've got to say, I, th- I think the best description I've, I've, I've seen of Jimmy all weekend really is Martin Samuel called him an artist, mm. right? An art, a pure artist, like taking the taking what he did well to a kind of different level, making it look so ridiculously easy when we all know it's the most difficult thing to do on the pitch. Um, uh, a, a, a brilliant, brilliant footballer, someone whose goals, when you watch them now, can still make the ears on the back of your neck stand up. Still, still, still find them incredible to watch. Aid. Um, I was lucky enough to spend time with Jimmy because he did, obviously when he was doing his TV stuff, he was a, a co-commentator, often working in the Midlands when I was at Villa, playing at Villa, um, and so I saw him on a number of occasions. Tremendous company, amazing company, you know, like great fun. Generally always saw the lighter, funnier sides of life and 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 uh, always quick with a one-liner and a joke. Uh, uh, I, mean, I remember once when at uh, Aston Villa, when they were, uh, they were, they just built the, the Doug Ellis stand. What's be, what is the Doug Ellis stand now? They just built that. And of course, all week they were talking about they're going to name it. What we're going to name it, and it was in the local paper about how they were going to name it, what they were going to call it, who was it going to be after a famous old player, who was it going to be, etc. Whatever. And of course, Doug was the chairman at the time, right? And uh, and Greavesy compared the, we were all there, all the players, and Greavesy compared the the kind of opening of the Doug Ellis stand. But there was the red bit of uh, curtain over the plaque. No one knew what it was going to be called. Nobody knew. Well, obviously someone, <laughs> someone knew. Anyway, so of course, Doug was up there. Jimmy's called Doug up there and to stand up there alongside him. And, uh, okay, okay, uh, Deadly said, would you then reveal to us all what, what, what the new stand is going to be called? So Doug pulls the, you know, the little string and all of a sudden the curtain goes back and it's the Doug Ellis stand, right? And Doug stood there and kind of turned around to the audience with like, Eyes wide open and jaw dropped, you know, like as if to say it's the biggest shock in the world. I can't believe the fans have voted for the Doug Ellis stand, you know. And Greavesy typically said, What a lovely surprise you've laid on for yourself, Doug, this afternoon, <laughs> you know, and brought the house down with it with a with a lovely little one liner. Um, but uh, ah, just a just a, a you know, you a giant of our game and and someone so uh, so likable, so affable. Someone who was always it was so it was so comfortable being in Jimmy's uh, uh, company and a great loss a great loss and respects to his friends and, and all his family at this time. Something amazing uh, has happened today. Which yesterday I tweeted a picture of the book that I've got in my hands, which is Jimmy Greaves' autobiography from 1979 called "This One's on Me." It's uh, one of the most open, frank, and honest, brutally honest books uh, that a, a footballer has ever written about himself. He wrote it with Norman Giller, who was just the previous guest just, on, on H&J just, heard just him, now. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and, and you know, obviously knew uh, Jimmy Greaves way, way better than any of us. Uh, and what he said at the end about Jimmy's wife Irene, I think he's, I'd like to echo that as well because. This really was an illness, alcoholism, Mm. that just grabbed hold of him. Mm -hmm. And I think he needed somebody like Irene. I mean, you might not believe, when Norman said, you know, she divorced him to help him, Mm -hmm. you know, to make him come to his senses, that's Mm -hmm. exactly what happened. But after that, they were divorced, but, you know, he had full respect for her. And she allowed him back into the family home to be with the family, which was all he wanted. This illness grabbed hold of him. He didn't want it to. So people who might have thought, just stop drinking, it's that it's not that easy. When it no. grabs hold of you, it's not that easy. I just And what happened today is extraordinary. So I've got this book at home. I collect old football books. And I've got this book at home, and I was reading bits of it yesterday, tweeted pictures from it yesterday, because it was, it kind of, it really, when, when somebody like that, you know, leaves us, it really hits you hard, doesn't it? And I just wanted to sort of immerse myself in, in the Jimmy Grief story again. So I was reading it, tweeting bits from it as well. This morning I come into work, and there's some posts for me, and somebody anonymously has sent me Jimmy Grief's book, this one's on me. Incredible. You know, not knowing that he was going to pass away this weekend, but just... No. So if it was you, whoever sent it, thank you so much. Do get in touch, because I'd love to know who it was sent me the book, because it, it, it is incredible. And I do want to take time to read a few passages from the book, because it does... When I say it, it's hard-hitting, um, it's called This One's On Me. The first chapter is called I Am An Alcoholic. S- chapter 7 is Hitting Rock Bottom. 5 is Drinking For England. And, you know, the first... First line of the book is, my name is Jimmy G, I'm a professional footballer and I'm an alcoholic. So you you understand, this is a confessional that's mm. going on here. If I just read some uh, bits from it. Um, he says in the first chapter, when I was just 19, Irene and I were devastated by the sort of cruel blow that for a long while left me hating the world. 
Our first son, Jimmy Greaves Jr., died of pneumonia at the age of four months. I've been brought up a Roman Catholic, but from that moment, I started to question everything I'd ever been taught and told about God and the church. These days, I'm spiritually stronger than I have ever been in my life, but I still want to scream with anger, frustration, and sheer inner pain when I think back to that tragedy. It left a deep, lasting scar on both Irene and me. Can you imagine having to cope with that? Mm. He was he was very young, 19. He's a teenager coping with that. Yeah. Any wonder, you know, that he, he turned to, to drink in his times of pain. It's mm. it's a book that's full of pain, but it's also fun, full of uh, fun. It's full of football as well. I'll read you another one here. Because what he does, in, rather than having a chapter or two where he says, I was a brilliant footballer, look at me. Mm. Irene put together 30, 30 scrapbooks, newspaper cuttings of his career. Mm. So he had those all the way through. And he refers to those. So little clippings from... Uh, football writers etc and he says in the middle of uh, revealing some of these scrapbook memories he says I'm enjoying these memories did I really score all those goals to be honest goal scoring came so naturally to me that I didn't realise I was doing anything particularly astonishing but now that I look back in my old age and judging it by today's goal standard I suppose I must have been a bit special mm. how humble is that yeah no, That's, it's amazing isn't it it is it is amazing and if you if, if you think of someone like Greavesy at that time in, in that era the era that he played in and, and his subsequent TV era um now that was an era when you weren't encouraged to to openly talk about things. You weren't encouraged to only if you sought and sought professional help. But you weren't really encouraged to do so mm. uh, in your everyday life. Um, and so, so there was always you're always carrying that around with you like a baggage permanently. Whereas nowadays, look, it's still not easy for people who suffer from various addictions. It's ironic we're talking about this today and, and Merce has released his, uh, a, a new book over the last few days. He was on Talk Sport this morning. He yeah. was on Talk this morning and, uh, you know, and I know I've played with Merce and I know how tough life has been for him at times. Um, very, very tough, no doubt. And, 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 but I'm just putting yourself in Greasy's situation, a hero to so many, a superstar to so many, but probably had to to hang on to a lot of this stuff, mm. Aid, and it didn't go anywhere. It never left his body, you know, and that's very, very difficult, I should imagine, to, uh, to cope with. Well, he says on page two, my personal rock bottom came in the early hours of a frosty winter's morning when I was ransacking the dustbin in my own back garden for empty vodka bottles that had been thrown away by my wife. She was trying to help him. Yeah. And he, this is like one of the greatest footballers, and, yeah. and that's what he's he's uh, he's resorted to. I mean, it's it's tremendously sad. But like, like I said, there is a lot of fun involved in the book as well. And let me give you a picture of how uh, the world saw Jimmy Greaves at that time as well. When he went off to Milan, he came back to Spurs. He, by the way, his goal record at Milan wasn't there long, but his goal record was phenomenal. It's like nine in fourteen. Anyway, came back to Spurs, and he says, "I made my first appearance for Spurs uh, in a reserve match at Plymouth. They had a record reserve attendance of thirteen thousand at Home Park." And the Argyle chairman, Ron Blindell, came onto the pitch with a microphone before kickoff mm. to welcome me back to English football. His words, uh, as the opposing players lined up to applaud me, on behalf of Plymouth Argyle, the people of Devon and Cornwall, but not least the whole of England, I say to you, welcome back. Yeah. He scored Can you two imagine goals. that now? Can you, yeah, well, there you go, exactly. <laughs> he would just, have done, wouldn't he? That's, that's a reserve game. The Ter opposition. T yeah, Terry Venables used to say to me about Jimmy playing light in slippers. Like he could, mm. like he played the game as if he had like a pair of slippers on, just drift, just floating on the top of the surface. I see the uh, speed and the, and the way he glided across the surface, yeah. but also the finishing as well. He caressed yeah. the ball, didn't well, he? That, and that's that what Martin says yeah. today in his article in the Mail. That that artistry, that that side of him, that was uh, so beautiful to watch. He was brilliant to watch, but there was a beauty about the way that he played the game and the way that he. And, and his craft, he was so good at it. And 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 again, because he was so humble, Jimmy. Uh, when people have asked him over the years about about how how he had this knack for it, he did, he, I don't know. I don't know how I get in those positions. Mm. I don't know why, but I just do. And all of a sudden, the ball seems to drop for me. And he always had that wonderful wonderful ability to uh, to put it in the back of the net. Yeah, great, well, great loss. But what a great life! Oh, what yeah. an amazing life! What an amazing player! And 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 someone that's that's touched touched us all. Anyone who's watched football, loved football, involved with football, as as all as all felt the warmth from Greavesy over the years. Uh, as an apprentice at Chelsea, 114 goals in one season, and the next season he got into the first team. Youngest player to score 100 league goals, he was 21. At 23, he got his 200th 
league goal. Scored on his debut for Chelsea, for England under-23s, for England, for AC Milan. Got a hat-trick on his debut for Spurs. Scored in his first FA Cup final in 1962. Spurs beat Burnley. Scored two on his West Ham debut as well. 44 in 57 for England. So he's not the re- he was the record holder. Bobby Charlton soon passed him and then Rooney has since then. 44 in 57. Mm. Rooney's 53 in 120. So the ratio is, it's mm. all grief. He retired at 27 from international duty. And he still went on to play for Spurs and had a good three or four years with Spurs and West Ham after that. Yeah. He retired from Eng- England duty because he went to Euro 68 with Alf Ramsey and he was an unused sub. Mm-hmm. And he said to her, Alf, listen, I don't want to be a bit part player. I'm Did done. I, I know, mate, quick, just very quickly. I know a lot of people recently have been, or over the last few days, have, have been saying that they kind of liken him to, to Lionel Messi, the way that he mm-hmm. moved. and, and uh, I saw him more as like... the. the 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 young Ronaldo, the Brazilian Ronaldo. Right, yeah. I saw him more when he went when when the Brazilian Ronaldo was at Inter as that incredible young player that could pick the ball up on the halfway line and just burst past people as if they didn't even exist and had that great shimmy from left to right and had great skill and, and then and, another gear. And then another gear. And then the poise when it mattered. Yeah. And then the real the real bit that means the most is in the box when you get the chance to tuck it away. He reminded me of of, uh, of that, Jimmy. Just uh, just wonderful to watch. Uh, more Jimmy Greaves memories to come. His drive on Talksport.